So last week as we celebrated Easter, we also started a new series called The Great Restoration and we're using the analogy of restoring cars and the similarities sometimes between us and vehicles that over time uh, we can get beat up and, and worn out and broken down just like vehicles but but Jesus is the great restorer he makes all things new again we come to him and he brings restoration if you're like me and you've got an active imagination and you can kind of just zone out and be thinking about all kinds of maybe strange things. One thing that I think about is the stories that these cars could tell, the, the experiences they have and the different things they've been through. The, the Mustangs that we're seeing restored in the video are from the, the 60s. This vehicle is from 1932. Just think about some of the, the, the history that these cars have. The, the man or the woman that bought that off the, the lot the, the first day in 1932 and the excitement as they, they drove it home. Maybe over the, the course of the years, this has been someone's gift for their 16th birthday and the excitement that, that surrounded it then. Maybe this vehicle brought a, a baby home from the hospital. and Just all the great memories. 1932, that's 80 some years of history. Think about the different people that have rode in that vehicle. Maybe famous people, maybe some great leaders, who knows are the people that have been affected in, in a part of this history. And there's also the negative side of things, maybe accidents that happened and bad memories associated with this vehicle, maybe arguments that happened as they were driving someplace. And again, we're a lot like vehicles in the sense that we have a history too. We have a past that we have to deal with. We all have those things that we, we wish we could do over, decisions we made. We think, boy, if I could just go back and change that, I would. I know I've got uh, those, those parts of my history and my past as well. When I was a youth pastor here, there was a lot of moments where I thought, boy, I shouldn't have done that, or I should have done that a lot differently than I did. One, one time we had a slip and slide on the hill out behind the church, and uh, we wanted to have the world's largest slip and slide. So I went to Lowe's, and I brought big rolls of black plastic, 200 feet worth. And we had 200 feet of black plastic on the hill out there, and I coated it with baby oil so it would get nice and slick. And the weather was going to be perfect. It was going to be like 95 degrees. And so before we got to this refreshing slip and slide, I had a bunch of different activities planned. We played games. and did a bunch of stuff at the church here and kind of built the anticipation for the world's biggest slip and slide. And the kids were all hot and, you know, just out in the sun all this time. And so we finally got to the slip and slide, and the first kid went down, and they got 20 or 30 feet down the slip and slide, and they started to scream. And as they're sliding down the hill, they're on their hands and knees, scrambling sideways to get off the slip and slide as fast as they could. And the next kid went down, and again, they're screaming, and they're frantically trying to get off this slip and slide. The boys that went down, they stood up, and their, their, their chests were pink. They were burnt. All day out in the 95 degrees, this black tarp with the oil, it was like a frying pan. <laughs> it was a disaster. It was the slip and slide from hell. It literally. <laughs> it, it was terrible. And so right away, I thought, oh, if I wish I could do I, We built this up. We got people here. This is terrible. It was one of those moments where you wish you could have a do-over. One time we got the youth together for a, a game of Ultimate Frisbee. I thought it would be fun down in the field down there. If you've ever played Ultimate Frisbee, you've got different teams, and you, you pass the Frisbee, and you've got goals that you're trying to get to to score. Well, I thought it would be exciting and kind of clever if we changed it just a little bit, and instead of a Frisbee, we used a big fish. And so I called it Ultimate Fishbee, and I thought that was clever. So I went to uh, Kroger, and I went to the seafood section, and I got a giant fish. And so we're down there, and we start playing Ultimate Fishbee. But, but again, uh, th there's screams. That was kind of a common theme in a lot of our... <laughs> now that I think about... Think about it, that was... Uh... So people are screaming in pain and grabbing their hands, and it turns out the... Uh, the spines or the fins on the back of the fish were, were slicing people's hands open. And so it was another one of those moments where I thought, boy, I wish I could do this differently. I mean, some of these were elders' kids. I'm worried about my job. I don't care about their <laughs> yeah, elders' kids and needs of, of medical attention. I'm trying to brush up my resume. But we all have those moments where, where you, you wish you could have a do-over. You think, boy, if I, could, if I would have just not said that or if I would have handled that situation differently, I wish I could change that. Moments in our past that we wish were different. And sometimes you can look back and laugh at it when it's something innocent like just burning children and slicing them open. <laughs> and we can all just laugh at that. But what about those memories, uh, those parts of our past that aren't so funny? Uh, th those parts of your past that actually caused some damage to you. And 
cause years of pain. Those, those moments, that maybe mistakes that just continue to haunt you and they, they seem like they're with you and they, they limit you in your relationships. They rob you of joy and opportunity because it's like you've always got this burden, this baggage that you're carrying with you from mistakes that you made or maybe the way you were affected by someone else's mistakes. This morning, I believe the Lord wants to say to us as we talk about restoration, your past does not have to define your future. That there's restoration even for those areas of your life. And I want to look at a passage of scripture in Luke chapter 15 where we see that we see that play itself out. Luke chapter 15. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. Okay, he, He's been describing uh, the kingdom of heaven and describing our heavenly father and trying to give us a picture of what that's like and using some analogies. So this is just a continuation uh, of that. He says, a man had two sons. The younger son told his father... I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, his younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. So there's a man with two sons. One of the sons, the younger one, comes to his dad and says, Dad, listen, I want my inheritance now. I don't want to wait around. Give me what I have coming to me now. That might be considered rude in our culture. If you had a child that did that, that would have been highly offensive in this culture because it was the equivalent of saying, I wish you were dead. I'm tired of waiting around for you to pass on. Give me my inheritance so I can just kind of move on to the next phase of my life. Just give me, I just want to cash in on this relationship and move on. And so the father, probably brokenhearted, agrees and he divides his wealth. This is the younger son. The older son would have gotten a double inheritance. So he basically gets a third of all that belongs to the father. And it's not long after that. He packs up everything he has and he moves off to a distant land, a foreign country. And it says that he wasted his money there on wild living. That that word wasted in the Greek, it literally means to scatter. Like if you scattered seed, just to take it and throw it without getting any return, you're just basically throwing the money, throwing your inheritance from your father, just throwing it away on wild living. We find out later in verse 30, apparently news of what, his bro- of what this boy was up to got back to his dad and his brother because his brother refers to the way that he wasted his father's money on prostitutes. That, that's the kind of thing that he was engaged in, just wild living, no restraint, just complete indulgence, and he wastes everything that the father gave him. Verse 14, about the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. So just about the time, unfortunately, the time he runs out of his own resources, there's a famine that hits the entire region, that things are tight, things are hard for everyone. They are in the middle of a severe famine. And he's able to persuade a farmer. He talks a farmer into giving him a job, and the job that he gets is feeding the pigs. He's a pig feeder. That is a low, lowly job for anyone, and if there's any pig feeders here. I apologize. I don't mean to be offensive. But that is a lowly position for anyone, but especially for someone who's Jewish. Because pigs were were unclean. They were vile, filthy, disgusting animals. And they're still pretty disgusting animals. You ever driven by a pig farm? The smell? I mean, if you don't know that that you're driving by a pig farm, you get upset with the people in the car with you. Start giving them dirty looks. (laughs) They're disgusting. They're filthy, vile animals. And so this guy, a, a, a Jew, is working to feed animals that are considered so unclean that they're not good enough to feed him. He, he's just hit the lowest place he can hit. He's at rock bottom. And this is just such a, a clear picture of what happens when we live a life of sin. The Bible tells us that sin is pleasing for a season. There's pleasure in it at first, 
But it's not long before the tables turn. And he went to engage in, in vile living. He went to, to go and do things that were unclean because they served him. They brought him pleasure. But it wasn't long before the whole thing had turned around and now he is serving the vile thing. Now he is serving what's unclean. Let, let me read to you just real quick from Romans chapter 6. It states this pretty clearly. Romans 6.16 says, Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Whatever you bow your knee to, you eventually become a slave to that. Whatever area of sin that at first brings you pleasure and you feel like it's serving you and bringing a smile to your face, it's working for you, you're mistaken. You're being deceived because it's just a matter of time before it's your master and you're serving it. We see that so clearly in this boy's life as he's now serving, feeding the pigs. And he's laying there watching these pigs eat and he becomes jealous of them, what they're eating. He's starving to death, he's hurting, and he's laying there in, in the mud watching these pigs eat and thinking, if only I had it as good as these pigs. Verse 17, when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I'll go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So as he's in this disgusting, filthy situation, feeding pigs, admiring what they have to eat, he comes to his senses. He has a moment of clarity. He, he begins to realize some things, that he is in a bad spot. And even the lowly people, the servants that, that are with his father, have more than enough. They've got more than they need. There is such an abundance in his father's household that that's where he should go. He should leave where he is and go home. But there's a problem. Because now he has a past. Now he's got some history that he has to factor into this equation. He can't just stroll into the living room and say, look who's home. Because he's made some mistakes. He's done some things that he's ashamed of. He's spent everything his father... He's got nothing to show for what his father gave him. This inheritance, a third of everything his father owned, it's gone. And he's been doing shameful things, terrible things. Things that he knows his father wouldn't approve of. Wasting his inheritance on prostitutes and wild living. Some of the baggage that he's accumulated is just the direct result of selfishness, the direct result of greed and pride, his own stupidity that cost him. And then he's got other baggage that's accumulated that just kind of, it was more indirect, just kind of being at the wrong place at the wrong time. That he's in a place where there's a famine. So he's starving, he's hurting, he's weak. It's because of the situation that he found himself in. He got a job, the only job he could find, he's feeding pigs. He's unclean, he smells, he's dirty, he's filthy. And so he comes up with a plan. He can't just go home. Things can't be the way they used to be because of his past, because of this history that he's accumulated. So the plan he comes up with is this. <clears throat> I'll go home and this is what I'll do. I'll say, Dad... That I know I can't be your son anymore. I know that due to the things I've done, what I've been through, the situation I'm coming, I, I know I threw it away. I can't be son to you anymore. But I'd like to come home with the understanding that, that my role will change. My role will now be less than. I'll have a lower position, and I'm going to have to work. I'm going to have to work for what I get from you. I used to have a spot just because of who I was, just because I was your child, just due to your love. I got to enjoy such incredible blessings. I know that can't be the case anymore. I know now I'm going to be kind of a second-class person in your household, and I know that I'm just going to, I'm going to have to strive and work for the portion of the blessings that I get to enjoy. I mentioned this was one of my favorite stories, and part of it is because I can relate so closely to this guy. Does that sound familiar to anyone else? Yeah, have you ever bargained as you approached returning to the Lord? Have you ever uh, kind of negotiated and allowed your, your past and your mistakes to kind of determine how you're going to proceed in your relationship with the Lord? God, I'm going to come back to you. I want, I want to have a relationship with you. 
But I know because of what I've been through. I know because of my past. I know because of some of the mistakes I've made. We're going to have to adjust the way we relate. I can't just come back as your son or daughter anymore. I know because of what I did, you're not going to love me the way that you love him. I know because of some of the choices I made, you're not going to be able to use me the way that you could have used me or the way that you use her. I know because of what I've had to endure or the situation that I found myself in. I know because of some of the filth that's accumulated in my life, things are going to have to be different. I don't know if you can relate to that at all. That, that bargaining, that negotiating that takes place. Well, that's exactly what he did. And he comes up with his plan. He prepares a little speech and how, how this is going to go. Dad, I'm no longer worthy to be your son. Take me on as a hired servant. And he gets his little plan together and he heads home. Verse 20. So he returned home to his father And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. So he returns home. He's walking down the road, probably reciting the speech. Make sure he gets it right. Dad, I can't be your son. Can't be your son, not what I've done. I've sinned against you. Take me on as a hired servant. Preparing, maybe a little nervous. He doesn't know what he's going to meet when he gets home. And his father sees him a long way off. And it says that he ran. He's moved with love. He's moved with compassion. His attitude is not, this guy ought to be ashamed of himself. I'm going to teach him a lesson. It's none of that. It's love and compassion. And he runs to meet him. And in that culture, dignified, wealthy, older men like this guy, you, you don't run. It's embarrassing. And remember, they wear robes. So just to run in the first place, you've got to gather up your garment and kind of hold it kind of awkward. That that just, it was something that was embarrassing and undignified in that culture. He doesn't care. He's more concerned with reuniting, being restored in this relationship than what other people think, than what's dignified. Who cares about all that? I see my son, and that's what his heart was, to be restored with his son. And when he gets to him, he embraces him. And remember, he's filthy. He smells. He's malnourished. He's disgusting. It doesn't matter. The father embraces him and kisses him. And this isn't just a little smooch on the forehead, welcome home, son. This is the same verb that we see in Luke chapter 7, verse 38, where it tells us the story of the woman who comes in with an alabaster bottle and begins to wash Jesus' feet with her tears and wipe them down with her hair and just kiss his feet repeatedly. It's the same verb. It's found in both places. So as he sees his son, he he wraps him in his arms and he just begins to kiss him over and over and over. His son said to him, and this sequence is important because up to this point, the son hasn't said a word. He hasn't issued his apology. He he hasn't said, Dad, I'm sorry yet. None of that. He hasn't said a word. And already he's been run to, embraced, kissed repeatedly. He probably has to pull back a little bit just to begin to start his speech Verse 21, his son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your servant, or your son. So he starts, he starts this speech that he's prepared, because remember, he has a plan. He has a plan of how he's going to make his, his way back into his father's house, household, how he's going to begin to work and show how sorry he's been. He's going to have to prove it by, by the work he does as a servant in his father's household. But the father cuts him off. He cuts him off. He doesn't even get to finish this speech that he's prepared. He doesn't get to the part about being a servant. He doesn't get to the part about, Dad, would you just hire me in and let me work for you? He doesn't get there because right away the father starts shouting out commands to the people around him. Verse 22, but the father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf with that we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. And this is a picture of complete restoration, that he is wiping out the son's past. As the son returns to the father, he is erasing all the poor decisions, not holding it over his head and making him pay. He didn't even let him finish the part about trying to earn his way back in. He didn't want to hear it. He says, bring a robe and put on him. And this is 
symbolic. He's, fil- he's, clo- he's filthy from his own decisions. His own efforts to try to live life on his own have left him a disgusting mess. And he says, bring out the best robe. Clothe him with the finest that we have. Symbolic. Uh, let's just show that he has been brought back into right relationship, right standing. He's clothed in righteousness as the father responds and, and restores him back to his proper place. He puts a ring on his finger, which was symbolic of authority. He gave his authority back to him in the household. You're, it's a place of belonging, restored to a place of authority. Sandals for his feet. Sandals were the mark of a free man. It was servants and slaves that went barefoot. But he's restored. And he's a free man. To kill the, the fattened calf so we can have a feast. We've got to have a party and celebrate. Remember, he's hurting. He's taking steps to, to meet the needs of where what caused him to be weak, what caused him to be in pain. He wants to bring healing and restoration and nourishment and remove that pain from his life. Just a picture of complete restoration, the Father's love. And this isn't a fairy tale. This isn't just some story that Jesus is telling, guys. Wouldn't this be nice? This kind of the ideal situation. This is the heart of the Father, that your past doesn't have to define your future. The way you proceed in your relationship with God doesn't have to be dictated by the guilt and shame and the baggage you've accumulated. His desire is to clothe you with right standing, with righteousness, to give you authority, to give you the mark of of a free man, of a free woman, to take the necessary steps to begin to restore what's caused pain in your history, the, the things that you were deprived of or the things that hurt you, that got you to that place of aching, that place of weakness, just to begin to restore, refresh, and nourish you. The only thing it would have cost him is what he would have inflicted on himself. That's what we do sometimes. After dinner, he could have kicked those sandals off and said, you know what, I just feel like I need to go stay outside with the servants and walk around barefoot. He could have inflicted that on himself, but that wasn't the father's heart. The father's heart was complete restoration. Your past does not have to define your future. And again, we could look at different examples of this. In the lives of different men and women from the Bible, King David... I don't know what comes to your mind when you think about David from the Bible. The the boy who was out in the the fields writing worship songs to the Lord, playing his harp as he watched over the sheep, or the guy that that killed Goliath, just such trust and faith, or maybe the, the man with such character and purity of heart that even when King Saul chased him around and was tormenting him, even when he had opportunity, his character was such that he wouldn't even raise a hand against the Lord's anointing. The man who is after God's own heart. Sometimes we we forget that David was more like us than we realize. David had a past. David had some some issues. He had some baggage. If you read 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12, see how David was someplace he shouldn't have been, looking at things he shouldn't have looked at, and he gets himself in a situation where he eventually commits adultery. He sleeps with another man's wife. He gets her pregnant. Now, this would be scandalous even in our culture. This would be a huge deal even for us if that happened with one of our leaders. But this is the people of God. This is the king of of the Jews that's doing this. And so in an effort to, to cover up what he's done, he has Bathsheba, this woman's husband, murdered. Has him killed. He's got some issues, some baggage. He's got a past. In chapter 12, God sends Nathan the prophet to tell him a story and helps to to open David's eyes to see the mistakes he's been making, the things he's done that he wished he hadn't done, if he could go back and just do things differently. He has that moment just like this boy in the, the pig pen of coming to his senses of realizing, I've made terrible decisions. I've done some things that I wish I could do differently, but it's too late. And he writes Psalm 51. Let me just read to you a couple verses from Psalm 51. Verses 2 and 3 say this, Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Maybe that's where you are with some of the issues from your past, mistakes that you've made, things that you've had to go through, things other people have done to you, that it haunts you. It haunts you day and night. You can't get away from it. You just can't seem to shake it. Another translation reads that it's ever before me. I wish I could just forget about that, but it is ever before me. 
Well, in verse 7, he continues, purify, purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. My sin is ever before me. It haunts me, the mistakes I've made. I just wish I wouldn't have done it, but I did, and I can't get away from it. But God, I know if you purify me, if you cleanse me, if you wash me, then I'll be free from all that. You'll cleanse me, and I'll be whiter than snow. When you wash me, I am clean. I'm free. When you restore me, Lord, it's a true restoration. Free from my past. David also wrote the 23rd Psalm. Let me read a couple verses to you from that. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He restores, restores my soul. That word restore in the Hebrew literally means simply to bring back, to return. He returns, he brings back my soul. Now remember that this analogy is of a shepherd. So when would a shepherd do any bringing back or returning? When a sheep wanders off, right? When a sheep wanders off, the heart of our father is to return it. And when a shepherd goes out and gets a sheep that's wandered off and returns it, brings it back into the flock, when he restores it, he doesn't bring it back for the sake of putting it in a separate little group uh, marked sheep that have wandered away. These are kind of second-class sheep. We've got our regular sheep, and then those ones over there, we kind of keep them at a distance. I brought them back, but not all the way back. No. He restores them. He brings them back like they never left. Restoration. I want to read one more passage of Scripture to you before we close from Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 19. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you, who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Because of the blood of Christ, he wants to bring you back holy and blameless as you stand before him, not with a bunch of baggage, not with a bunch of marks from your past, not a second level, holy and blameless as you stand before the Lord because of the restoration, a new robe, a ring on your finger. He wants to restore you not continue to remind you of your past. And he goes on to say this in verse 23, but you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. You've got to hold on to this truth. You've got to stand there because the enemy will continue to try to remind you of your past mistakes and things you've been through and why you don't qualify for this and why you're not good enough to be loved like God loves him and why he can't use you the way he could have used do if you just would have made some decisions otherwise. Complete restoration, holy and blameless. And then a reminder, you've got to continue to hold on to this. Stand firmly in it. Don't allow your own emotions or your own thought patterns or what someone else says about you or lies that the enemy whispers to you cause you to drift away. And he gives us this reminder because it happens so repeatedly in people's lives that they drift away from being sure of God's love for them, of being absolutely certain that they are righteous and holy and blameless before him. Don't drift away from the assurance you had when you first heard the good news that God loves you and he sent his son to die for you to wash away your sins and to make you clean before him so that you can have relationship. Don't drift away. You must continue. You've got to continue to believe this truth. You've got to stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you first heard the good news. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes?